cell phone. Um, in my, my very first interview was a, an interview with, with Scott Simon on NPR, and I, I had this vision of going into this steel tower and being behind the frosted glass where the producer says, three, two, you know, no, it's just, yeah, my cell phone. And, and I typically do them while I'm traveling. So I will be, you know, I'll be in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'll be on my cell phone, and I'll be on the air live in Lexington, Kentucky. And the interesting thing about the NPR interviews is they get, they're recorded live to tape. And so they get disseminated to other affiliates. And so I'll get emails from people that will say, you know, I love the interview you did in Topeka. And I'm thinking, I've never been to Topeka. <laughs> um, so I must have did one of those interviews. And, and I did an interview in Portland, Oregon, where, this is my, 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 favorite, my favorite interview. I was in my hotel room in Portland, Oregon, and I'm on my cell phone, and I'm on the air live. And there was this tremendous moment of live radio that went just like this. Housekeeping! <laughs> I, I had the thing hanging on my door, you know, which I, I've learned this. No enforcement of that device. Um, so if you, if you happen to be you know, in, in the Park County area and you listen to NPR and you hear an interview where this woman brings me fresh towels, um, please email me. You know how that sounds. Because I'm dying to hear that one myself. Um, another, another interesting thing about interviews is that, is that I, I do get asked a, a repetition of questions uh, pertaining to, to the novel. And, and that's, that's okay. That's part, part of that is having a, a publicist that sends out a, a, a press kit that shepherds that discussion. But I, I do, I really, I get asked the, the very similar questions. I get asked, I, I call them the, the quantitative questions about the book. I mean, naturally about the Japanese internment. Um, occasionally there'll be questions about race relations between Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans. There might be an intrepid line of questioning about the Seattle jazz scene as it existed at the time, something of that nature. And, and we'll do Q&A, and I am happy to talk about, about anything. Um, but what's really interesting to me, now that the book's been out for a while, that the paperback's been out for about a year, is I do get a lot of emails from readers now. And the emails I get from readers are quite different than the, the feedback that I get in an interview setting. The, the emails I get from readers are much more qualitative. I mean, they're, they're, they tend to be like, you made me cry. You know, they're very heartfelt, or I'm still crying. I'm on Prozac, I can't stop crying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm an author, but I'm still a reader. And I, I, I remember those moments where I would, I would have a book and I'd be about, 400 pages into a 500 page book and it would be, you know, 1230 on a Sunday night and I'm just thinking, I'm calling in sick tomorrow, you know, because I'm <laughs> going to finish this book. And so, for, for me as an author, it's really rewarding to, to see, you know, readers partaking of the emotional currency that's in the book, whether that's the bitter of the internment or the sweet of the, the, the friendship and the love story. And because I, I, I never, in an interview setting, I never talk about those more qualitative things. I do, I'm gonna take a few minutes and talk about the love story. Because love stories are these, are these very weird things, and that's probably why you know, it never comes up. But I'm, I'm gonna sidebar and talk about that for, for a moment. And, and love stories are these peculiar creatures in that if, 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 you know, if this was a movie theater, and what was showing was a, you know, a, a sad, heartbreaking love story kind of film. When the lights come on, you can really see the two camps emerge. You know, you can see the people on one hand that are, they're fishing in their purse for Kleenex, and then there's another group that is just looking around bewildered, like that was a waste of eight bucks. You know, <laughs> where was the car crash? Where was the gun battle? Where was the asteroid collision? Uh, and not just as an author, as a writer, but as a person, I, I knew where I fell on that emotional Richter scale. From a, a very young age, from the age of about 
I'm gonna say about nine years old. And at the time, I was living in a, in a little town of Ashland, Oregon, um, which is a great little little place to grow up. But if you if you live in Ashland, if you're growing up in Ashland in the in the the late '60s, early '70s, it, it might have been like Cody in that we were either blessed or cursed to have one television channel, and, and that was it because there was no satellite dishes and cable hadn't quite reached the hinterlands. And as a kid growing up in Ashland, you know, you just watch whatever's on, and and so I watched some weird television. And I watched this movie, your typical ABC movie of the week, and it really informed the kind of storyteller I would later become. And it was this movie called James at 15. Does anyone remember this movie? Ah, <laughs> um, my people are here. <laughs> Not the alarm. Um, James at 15, very simple movie, very simple love story. And you know, my given name is James, so I was, I was a little interested. And it was set in Oregon where I was living, so I was definitely interested. Aside from, you, know, you only have one channel, what else are you going to watch? Um, but James at 15 was this, uh, this movie about this boy pining away for this impossible girl. And he gets the girl in the end, in a very benign, lovely 70s kind of way. You know, it's not the Jersey Shore or the, the, the Real Housewives or wherever. Very simple story. But James at 15 did not end there. It ends on this note where James and his family are packing up and moving to Boston. And so the movie ends on this scene where you know, the, the U-Haul is packed. James is in the back of the all-American wood panel station wagon that we all used to drive. And he's in the back waving goodbye to his sweetheart, who is waving back as they pull away from the curb, drive on down the road. <coughs> There was a sad piano music. Credits just started to roll. And that was the end. And I remember watching this as a little kid and thinking, oh, love sucks. <laughs> this is awful. This is terrible. And it was, it was the first, I was, I was so caught up in the story. And at this point in my life, you know, I had never seen an interpersonal relationship that didn't come from Disney. You know, the, the, the Nutty Professor was about as deep as I went. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I was, I was so vested in this, this story. I was so vested in these characters that when I did not get the outcome I was expecting, <coughs> excuse me, you know, I was really stricken. I, mean, I, I, was, I was overcome to the point of tears. and. I mean, not even the dismissive little, you know, it's my allergies, you know, kind of <laughs> moment. I was, I was overcome. And I, I look back now, and I can picture my father sitting in his easy chair, and, you know, I, I, I'm a dad. Um, there's plenty of gentlemen in the room. I'm sure there's some dads in the room. And when you're a father, when you're a dad, you have some form of the dad list. And I can picture my dad regarding his young son just bawling at this cheesy movie of the week, and taking out his imaginary dad list and just thinking, football scholarship, no. <laughs> Basketball, no. Um, and, and, and as a result, not just of that night, but probably a, a lot of nights like that, my, my dad actually encouraged me to go into the arts. So he, I went to art school. Um, which is a real noble leap for a parent, because I have a son that wants to major in music, and I'm encouraging him. Um, but there is that part of me that's just like, man, be a dentist. Be a dentist. <laughs> um, but I did. I, I, I went to art school, graduated from art school, and I, you know, I later became a writer. So I, you know, I like to say, you know, I support a writer's touchdown, Dad. Um, but I, as a little kid, I went to school the next day, and everyone at school is calling me James at 15. Like, hey, James at 15, because they all saw the same movie. We all had one channel, right? <laughs> but they hated it. <laughs> I loved that movie. And in a, a textbook moment of peer pressure collapse, you know, I just boxed that experience up. I tucked it in the attic of my mind, never really to look at it again. And I, and I, didn't, I didn't think about that movie for decades. And it wasn't until I was fumbling around with fiction, trying to figure out how to write, what to write, you know, uh, authorly voice, all these little nuanced things about the business of, 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 of telling stories. 
And when you're an author, it, it's, it's difficult because it's like being given, I mean, not just an author, but a writer. If you're a writer of poetry or song lyrics or prose or screenplays or memoir, it, it's like being given a box of a million crayons and you have to choose the colors. And I'm half Chinese on my father's side and I, I had never written anything with Asian American characters. I'd written a completely separate other novel that's unpublished that didn't have Asian characters because I didn't think anybody cared. Uh, I love history. I, I, I'm a huge fan of history. I mean, I read a lot of nonfiction, and, and I, I didn't think about writing something historical because I thought that was the realm of nonfiction. And on top of that, as, as you'll come to know, as a, I do have a, a deep abiding weakness for love stories, and I, and I hadn't gone there as a writer. But where I did go about this time was I went to one of these weekends for newly engaged couples um, with my then fiance now wife. And, and that alone is a weird social experiment. Um, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's so unfair because, you know, you know we were. We, we were a bit older than everybody else, so we were like the chaperones on prom night. And, and, you know, we, we walk in and everyone thinks we're the host couple. Like, we're, you know, we're, just, we're happily betrothed, just like you. Um, but we go in, and, and, and it was true. Everyone in the room was very young. We're right in college, or still in college, just out of college. And the first thing they had us do was, was stand up and tell the, the Cliff's Notes version of how we first met. And so it goes around the room. And the first young, sterling, college-age gentleman, he, he stands up and he, he turns to his fiance and he says, and I quote, well, I woke up and she had my t-shirt on. I figured I better ask her what her name was. <laughs> yeah. I think my wife fainted. It was so romantic. You know, <laughs> trying to her. The heavens part. And there's doves flying. You know. But it does. It goes around the room, and everyone's first meeting was spring break or a frat party or jello shooters were somehow involved. Um, and it comes around to me, and, and I had to stand up in front of this very young group, this post collegiate coupling experiment. And share with them that I met my wife at that hotbed of swinging singles activity known as the public library. <laughs> they did not clap. <laughs> um, it was a, more like a patina of nervous laughter. Like, uh, no, really, where'd you meet her? It was the public library. Um, it wasn't uh, singles night at the library, it wasn't wet t-shirt night at the library, I wasn't hanging out in the 300 section hitting on strange women that cruise by. For those of you that, that don't remember your Dewey Decimal system, that's human sexuality. Um, it was just the public library. Um, and I later proposed in a, in a bookstore. Um, you know, and, but see, that's what I knew. I wasn't James at 15. I was James at 40, and I was a bit of a precocious kid, I, I became a precocious adult, and it really, it turned me loose to write what I really wanted to write, which was something that explored the Asian American experience, something that explored my father's childhood, my grandfather's upbringing, um, something that was very historical, geographical something that's, that was a, a bit of a love story, that was a throwback love story. Um, and so the, for those of you that, that haven't read Hotel, The Quarter of Bitter Sweet, it is, it's a very simple love story. And it's the story of young Henry Lee, a Chinese-American boy who, not long after the bombings of Pearl Harbor, is sent to an all-white private school, as sent by his parents, ostensibly to become more American. And there he meets young Keiko, who's Japanese-American girl sent there by her parents for identical reasons. And together they form a very simple something. And fortunately, because of the, 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 the festivities pertaining to this weekend and where we are geographically located, um, you know, we, we do have a, a knowledge of the 
I'm sure some people in this room have a very intimate knowledge of the Japanese internment. And so we know at some point, Henry's going to lose Keiko, because Keiko's going to be taken away. Keiko, her family, her community, ultimately 120,000 Japanese Americans and nationals, are they going to be taken away and reincarcerated for their protection, even though the machine guns point in and not out? And I, I, we talk about that. You know, growing, up, growing up in the Seattle area, I had a cursory knowledge of the internment. Uh, one of my best friend's fathers was interned. But you take for granted that everyone knows this. And I do book events all over the country. And I remember doing an event in Chicago where a, a woman came up to me and she said, I'm a retired history teacher. I taught history for 30 years, middle school. And not only did we never teach about the internment, I didn't really know about it. And so there are aspects of history that, that, that will get you know, swept under the rug. Um, but Ho tells also the story of that character of Henry as a grown man. And he's in his 50s, and he's a widower now. And he's a man living with his lament. And he's looking back on that time and trying not to look back at that time. And he's, he's thinking about the things he did or didn't do. And he's walking down the street through what's left of Japantown, through Chinatown, through Seattle's International District. And he passes an old hotel. And the new hotel owners made an interesting discovery. She discovered the belongings of 37 Japanese families that had stored those belongings there as they were being, as they were heading off to camp. And those belongings remained there. And as these things are coming up out of the basement, he sees something that he's pretty sure had belonged to Keiko. And in that moment, you know, he, he really has to reconcile the past and the present and to think about the things he said, and the things he think, you know, think about the things he left unspoken during that time period. And for, for those of you that haven't read the book, I'll kind of I'll stop right there, because I don't want to give away any spoilers. I um, don't want to give away the flaming car crash where Keiko dies on page 187. <laughs> Oops. Um, I, I, I actually did a, a book event in Spokane, Washington, and um, during the Q&A, this lovely woman stood up and in the body of her question gave away the entire ending of the book. Um, and I thought the book group ladies around her were just going to rise up with their hardbacks and just beat her down. So I don't want to do that. Um, but what I want to do, can I borrow your book? Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple, I'm literally going to read two pages. I'm, I'm a bit of a minimalist when it comes to writing, and I'm, I'm even more of a minimalist when it comes to, uh, to authors doing readings. Um, and, and, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One is I, I was at a, I can't remember where I was, I was at a book festival, I think it was in Texas, and I was about to read, and this silver-haired, sweet little old lady in the background stood up and yells, we already know how to read! <laughs> she was very offended that I would read to her. So, um, I don't want to offend anybody, but thank you for letting me read to you. Um, and and the, other, the other reason is um, you know, why I do keep it short. And this, this is my own personal theory slash paranoia about author readings, is that I have this theory that because we were all read to as children at bedtime, that one of these days I'm going to go one page too long, I'm going to look up and it's just going to be like, oh. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, this is about 70 pages into the book, and the, the book is Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. I, I do think there are equal measures bitter and sweet, but this is some of the bitter, and, and I need to preface it as such. And at this point in the story, we've met Henry, we've met Keiko, they've met each other. It's very clear that there's a simple affection between the two of them. But what's going on in the greater Seattle area at the time, shortly after the bombings of Pearl Harbor, the FBI are making raids into Japantown. And they're, and they're, they're confiscating radio equipment and camera equipment. And they're arresting and detaining Japanese Americans and nationals that they suspect are likely candidates for spying and, and espionage, like school teachers. You know, those that spoke both languages fluently were 
often deemed suspect. You know, there were there were banks that turned over lists of their customers with Japanese sounding names to the FBI um, census records, and so yeah, and you know we we got a, a good healthy taste of that kind of hysteria post 9/11, but boy something something much deeper, you know, and, and when I heard mention of blackout curtains as far inland as, as, as Cody, um, you know, I, I, I talked to farmers as far inland as, as Yakima and you know, central Washington that talked about after the bombings of Pearl Harbor going up onto the roof of their barns with guns expecting Japanese planes to fly overhead. Um, it was that kind of, you know, the taproot of, of, of fear. You know, things like uh, a Japanese submarine surfaced in the Bay Area and fired a couple shells on an oil refinery and then took off. And enough of these token attacks in concert with Pearl Harbor to really create the feeling that they, the enemy was at our gates. And so Henry knows these raids have gone on the night before. And he goes to school the next day, and Keiko's missing. And so fearing for the safety of his friend, he cuts class. He runs outside. And he sees smoke billowing over the rooftops in the direction of Japantown. And that's where we jump into this part of the story. In the heart of Japantown, Henry found the Ochi Photography Studio once again. He couldn't miss the young proprietor who stood outside on a milk crate looking through a large camera mounted on a wooden tripod. He was shooting in an alley that ran in the same direction as Maynard Avenue, where Henry saw the source of the fires. They weren't Japanese homes or businesses as he feared. There were large burning barrels and garbage cans set ablaze in the alley, fire and smoke pluming up and over the apartment buildings on either side. Why are you taking pictures of garbage fires? Henry asked, not sure if the photographer even recognized him. The man looked through Henry, and his eyes blinked as he seemed to remember him. It must have been the button Henry wore. The photographer turned back to his camera, his hands shaking. They're not burning garbage. Henry stood at the tee where the alley met the street next to the photographer on his milk crate, with his camera and his flash bulbs. Looking down the alley, he could see people coming and going from the apartment buildings, throwing things into the burning barrels. A woman yelled out of the third story window to a man below and threw down a plum colored kimono that looped and swirled, settling like falling snow on the dirty slug trail pavement of the alley. The man below scooped it up, regarded it for a moment, hesitated, and threw it on the fire. The silky fabric lit and burning pieces floated out of the heat like butterflies whose wings caught flame, fluttering on the draft, flickering out, raining down as black ashy dust. An old woman brushed by Henry with an armload of papers, threw him into the fire where they made a whooshing sound. Henry felt the rush of heat on his cheeks and stepped back. Even from a distance, he could see there were scrolls and artwork written and drawn by hand, large Japanese characters disappearing into the heart of the fire. Why are they doing this? Henry asked, not fully understanding what he was seeing. We arrested more people last night, Japanese, all over the city, all over Puget Sound, all over the state, maybe. People are getting rid of anything that might connect them to the war with Japan. Letters, clothing, it all must go. Too dangerous to keep even old photos. People are burning photos of their parents and of their families. Henry watched an old man wearily place a neatly folded Japanese flag into the nearest burning girl, saluting as a bird. The photographer snapped the shutter on his camera, capturing the scene. I burned all my old photos last night. He turned to Henry, the tripod shaking as he held it. With his other hand, he wiped his mouth with a handkerchief. I burned my own wedding photos. Henry's eyes stung as they filled with smoke and soot. He heard a woman yelling something in Japanese somewhere in the distance, and it sounded more like crying. We had a traditional wedding right here at Nihonmachi. We took our photos at the Washington Park Arboretum in front of the magnolias and the rock roses. We wore kimonos and Shinto dressing that had been in my family for three generations. The photographer looked haunted by the scene in front of him, haunted by the destruction of touchable, tangible reminders of life. It burned it all. Henry had seen all he could take. Turning, he ran home, still tasting the smoke. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, 
I, I like to read that scene because it's, it's very short, but it encapsulates a lot of the history, the fiction and the nonfiction. And it was one of those moments that as I was doing my research and I came across, uh, it was a journal entry or an interview where someone mentioned burning their family photos. These things, <laughs> um, I mean, they, they stopped me as a, as, a, as a researcher, stopped me as a writer. Um, and little aspects of that story that uh, really make fiction come alive, even though it's heartbreaking. Um, just, just curious, who, who's here for the pilgrimage this weekend? All right, cool. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you for being here. Um, and and it's, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, I'm uh, on the board of the Wing Legation Museum in Seattle, and uh, they want to, to send their best to, to everyone here. Um, before, we, you know, before we jump into to Q and A, the, the one question that I do get asked a lot, and I, and I, I might as well kind of um, answer this one, is I get asked how much of my own family story is in the book. And, and while the book is not autobiographical or biographical, there is a bit of, of my story, my father's story, and my grandfather's story in the book. Um, and so I want to touch on those three little areas. Um, my, my grandfather, who was Chinese, was 